Great. Well, th thanks. You know, as we end uh, 2020, this is a time of, uh, you know, thinking through a lot of things. It's been quite a year. But as I was thinking through it, I realized that it was about 20 years ago when you testified before the U.S. Senate. So that was March of 2000. And I took a few minutes and just read through your testimony that you gave. And a couple sections really stood out. So I'd love to get your thoughts on a few things, because what I want to do is take this webinar and look back at the past and then take stock of where we are and look a little bit into the future and make some projections. But um, this comes from your recommendations section of the testimony that you gave. And you say the methods that will most effectively minimize the ability of intruders to compromise information security are comprehensive user training and education. Enacting policies and procedures simply won't suffice. Even with the oversight, the policies, the procedures may not be effective. My access to Motorola, Nokia, AT&T, Sun depended on the willingness of people to bypass policies and procedures that were in place for years before I compromised them successfully. Um, and then you go on and you say the corporate security measures that I breached were crafted by some of the best and brightest minds in the business, some of whom may even have consulted on, uh, and there was a, a bill number that was in the Senate at the time. Um, do you have any thoughts as you think back 20 years ago about those words? Yeah, definitely. I, it's, a, it's pretty vivid in my mind. I remember it was quite interesting. So. As we all know, I was in a little bit of trouble. And then in January of 2000, I was released from federal custody. And then literally three months later, I received a post, a postal email, not an email, postcard from uh, Joseph Lieber, Lieberman and Fred Thompson that they wanted me to come testify for Congress. So it was quite interesting to go to the you know probation department and said, hey, listen, I need to travel to Washington DC to testify, you know, so it was uh, quite the surprise. But what this whole um, congressional meeting was about was how the federal government could better protect any systems that were owned or operated by them. And they invited me to testify, you know, based on my, you know, background, but more specifically on the social engineering threats. And I remember doing an initial presentation for a group of uh, congressmen. And then they came to the question and answer uh, session, which went quite some time. And uh, at the end of the day, I was trying to educate Congress that they really need to take training people seriously because in my black hat days, I was extremely effective at convincing people to do things over the telephone because back you know, in my days, it was phone pretexting. Um, and then in 2000, that's when the ARPANET became the internet, well, kind of 1995. So now we have a different vector of phishing, but it's really all the same. You know, social engineering is social engineering, whether you're using email or the telephone. So I was really trying to encourage Congress, hey, you guys need to step up, make, you know, uh, pass some legislation that requires companies to train their people and maybe even consider doing some sort of public service announcements on television, not on you know on cable, on broadcast TV, to really educate people about the scams out there. Because unless people are educated and know that these scams exist and how they work, they're likely going to fall for it if they're targeted. Yeah, right. Um, you know. It's it's really interesting as you look through your testimony. I mean, this this topic of social engineering comes up as a constant thread through it, and really is the heart of of what we do at Noble for, which is you know trying to help people be more resilient against social engineering. But then I'm I'm again struck by point three in your recommendations, where you say implement policies, procedures, standards, and guidelines consistent with the risk assessment and cost benefit analysis. And then you end with a sentence that says, employee training to recognize sophisticated social engineering attacks is of paramount importance. And then now look at you 20 years later, uh, you know, the chief hacking officer of the largest security awareness 
company in the world that also specializes in simulated social engineering and really draws from the the richness of uh, of your expertise and your past to make sure that that's successful and be you know showing real world attacks and and helping people to be more resilient against those yeah it's quite you know quite interestingly in 2007 i was going to team up with a very well known actor and we were going to do these security awareness training videos yet it fell through because of funding issues and then i was then i met Stu in 2011 and it was like the perfect you know the perfect relationship because this is exactly what i've always wanted to do and what i mentioned in my uh, congressional testimony is you could have all the policies procedures and standards and guidelines in the world but if people don't follow them the bad actor is still going to get in so I was really trying to encourage Congress, yes, the policies, the procedures are absolutely necessary. You know, that sets kind of the rules, but at the same time, it's really necessary to train people and really clue them in into how the bad actors operate. Because if you don't know how they work, if they're gonna if they're gonna attempt to target you through phone pretexting, phishing, through you know, physically, you know, trying to physically get into your facility or something like this, and you're not aware uh, in, you know, of these types of attacks. And people are normally honest. I think you know, 80% of us are you know, honest people, but you gotta watch out for that maybe you know, 20% or less that might try to abuse the situation. So I really, back in March of 2000, you know, I, I still think the same way, uh, that it's really critically important to educate the, you know, the human element. Uh, and then layer that, of course, with the layer, you know, with the with the technology. So if the human fails, we have the technology to catch it. Now, of course, I fully recommend uh, that tools be developed to help humans detect stuff. So if we could build the tools that help people detect social engineering attacks, by all means, we should leverage those tools. Yeah, I mean, I I think that we have to recognize that this is never an either or discussion. So when we argue passionately for awareness training, we're not saying that technology is totally ineffective, but technology is never going to be fully effective. And so neglecting that human side of things is ultimately kind of settling for mediocrity or settling for something that's never as good as it could be. Uh, as it would be if we were to, to invest heavily in both of those aspects and really build resilience across technology and humanity at the same time. Now, uh, as you kind of sit 20 years you know, past this time where you were in front of the Senate, um, what does it say to you that we are still having the same discussion now? Well, d does, that, does that strike you as maybe the world has failed in some way, or is it just kind of this, the, the way that things will always be? I just think it's hard. You know, you could build technology to hopefully detect all the malware in the world, which by the way, it's not, you know, 100% effective as we all know, but the human, you know, to, to uh, motivate people, to change their behavior, to educate them on what could actually hurt them, that's really hard work. And it's not like I could fault someone and say, oh, you know, the Senate didn't listen to me and, you know, and that's just that. No, it's just, it's an extremely difficult, um, I would say mitigation, uh, strat not a stra difficult strategy, it's just difficult to do. It's difficult to educate people because of how humans think. Because once you educate them about a particular problem, then over time, I think they forget about it. Just like something in the news, you know, we see uh, a, a press release on something that's very concerning and here today, gone tomorrow. So what I really think, you know, that, you know, what we do, like you and I do in our work, Perry, is we help uh, people stay alert. And I think that's the key. I think staying alert, having that healthy dose of paranoia is extremely important. And of course, in some corporate cultures, you know, that might not be the way, you know, they might have trust everything, trust everyone. And, uh, Again, I think you know we need to educate, you know, and offer that helping hand that we're here to help you. Yes, you know, we want that open, trusting culture, 
but at the same time, we don't want to get scammed. We don't want Lucy in finance to send out that bank wire, right, and potentially bankrupt the company. So again, you know, there's a there's a I think a delicate bounce between you know that healthy dose of paranoia and education, and we need to get in the you know we need to get in the center of that to really help people, you know, be resilient against these type of attacks. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I love the fact that you mentioned that, hey, you can continue to, to try to teach people things, but after a while that, that learning starts to go away and needs to be reinforced. reinforced. You know, there's a, a psychological name for that, which is the, the decay of learning. And it's uh, almost, you know, immediately within minutes, there's about a 50% drop off in what somebody was exposed to to what they're able to ret retain, and then it starts to slowly decay further over time after that. But being able to continually get in front of people with the same reinforcing messages is is critical. Um, and it is hard, uh, you're right, dealing with, with humans and dealing with the fundamental human problems is really, really difficult. And so working that at all angles and with consistency is, is going to be key. Um, Oh, sorry for interrupting. No, go but, ahead. You know, what makes it extremely difficult is not necessarily educating humans. It's really looking up the trade craft that the bad actors use because they're very, very, very good at building trust and credibility in their attacks. In fact, one of the demos that we're going to show later shows a technique that I use to, you know, increase that, uh, that trust factor. So then it becomes, you know, how do you really analyze the situation that's happening to really detect these types of threats? Because a threat actor could spend a ton of time looking at you as a person, looking at the company, looking at whether they can compromise like an internal email address and then send an email to you as somebody internally, right? Then it becomes really difficult to you know, detect because you can't spend all day distrusting every email that you receive or every phone call, otherwise you'd never get work done. But what I hope to accomplish, at least you know through now before, is really training people's brain in a in a way to be that, you know, that that social engineering detector, if you will. Like it took me years of experience, right? Of, you know, obviously being on the offensive using social engineering, but also on the defensive. You know, certain situations have come up in my life where people have tried to scam me and then it just made me smarter. So when somebody comes along with a, the same or similar scam or something that doesn't add up, I know what's really interesting, Perry, is I have a really good gut sense um, and people should really trust their gut, is when, you, when it's sometimes too good to be true or there's something that's a little bit off, you should really do a deeper dive on that analysis to make sure you're not being abused or scammed. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I tell everybody that if you ever read anything or end up in a situation that causes a heightened emotional response and your your tendency is to click on something or to, to respond in some way immediately, well, then it's time to have a gut check and just take a step back, take a deep breath, go do something else, disengage, and then come back logically with that. You know, we had talked in the past about um, Daniel Kahneman's System 1 and System 2 thinking. Uh, the, the crafty attacker is always trying to push you into a System 1 knee-jerk mm -hmm. response that's extremely automatic. And if we can intentionally go back into System 2 and think logically and methodically through something, then we're more likely to take the right path or the safer path. Right, and people like to, you know, people, uh, you know, tend to be polite and they want to be liked. So when you ask them for a simple request that just seems so normal and reasonable and not threatening in any way because you really don't know, you know, all the aspects of the request, that puts you in a bad position. And I'm sure we'll, you, you'll be queuing up later uh, a demonstration of, that could be done in a coffee shop where you just approach somebody and uh, you ask them for something reasonable, but at the end of the day, they're being compromised. So that, that's what the real tough thing to do is you really, you really need people that have their ground to the, you know, they're pretty much their ear to the ground. I was saying it backwards. <laughs> their ear to the ground, really paying attention to how these threat actors pull off their capers and then constantly reminding us 
as you know, people that work in organizations, what type of tricks these fraudsters are doing. So we become much more aware and much more able at realizing it's a scam. And then, of course, we could you know, obviously not cooperate. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's definitely good advice. So, you know, I, th I think it's really interesting that those two things that you talked about in your testimony as recommendations are still key. So that social engineering resilience is key and the awareness and training piece is key. And it sounds like if you could give the same testimony today, those same things would still come out. Um, but well, we've, we've taken a look. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've, we've taken a look back 20 years um, now let's look forward and talk about some of the emerging social engineering threats. But first, I do want to cue that demo that you alluded to, um, because I think it proves what we're talking about is that social engineering is powerful and it's always evolving and adapting to what the most current technology is. So let's let's roll this. Um, this is the the uh, that coffee shop style attack. Kevin, is there anything you want to say before we roll that to tee it up? Uh, not really. I mean. I, uh, we could discuss it afterwards, but I actually did exactly what this attack is, uh, this attack is gonna illustrate in a recent security assessment, and it worked like a charm. But we, let, let's let the audience take a look at the video, and then we could quickly uh, mention that. Great, here we go. Hi, I'm Kevin Mitnick. I'm Nobafor's Chief Hacking Officer. Due to the global pandemic, I'm filming this demonstration from the comfort of my home office. So today I want to discuss how dangerous it is to plug in any device into your computer from an unknown source. And in some cases, it could appear to even be a trusted source. So we've all learned over the last five or 10 years, never plug in a USB flash drive because a bad actor could weaponize these drives, so when you plug it in, it installs malware on your computer. But what about other devices, like USB mice, a charging cable for your phone, or other devices that you plug into the USB port? Could that be dangerous? So that's exactly what I want to demonstrate today, is how dangerous it could be to simply plug in a charging cable into your computer because a threat actor could get the keys to the kingdom, namely all your login credentials you store in your browser and even access to the websites you're currently logged into, even if you're using two-factor authentication. So let me show you the setup here. On my left, I have the victim's computer. On my right is the attacker computer. So what's the pretext here? The pretext is I wanna target somebody that's sitting in a coffee shop I walk in with my phone, I walk in with my cable, the phone will be dead. And I basically ask the target if they'll please charge my phone for just a moment until it powers up because I need to make an urgent call. So that's the pretext. So let's go over to the victim's computer here. We can see that we're logged into Gmail. We're also logged in here to the uh, Amazon Cloud. We're logged into Facebook. We're logged into Twitter. Uh, we're logged into Office 365 here. And if we look over here, we have stored credentials, several different websites here with stored passwords. So this is the information I, as the threat actor, want to steal and gain access to. So the victim goes ahead and they plug in the cable first so they could charge my phone. Let's go ahead and do that. And we plug in the phone. And as you'll see, it will pop up uh, a box on the screen that it detected the phone, but we'll go ahead and close it because it doesn't really matter. And as soon as the victim plugs in the phone with this Bluetooth transmitter device, or I could even use another phone if I want, I basically click a button. Before I do it, I'm gonna distract the target. I'm gonna maybe ask a question so they're paying attention to me. I click the button. It pops up just for a second on their computer, and when that's done, it's game over. They've already been compromised. So now, I let the, the phone charge enough to where it turns on. I thank the victim very much. They hand me back my phone, they hand me back my cable, and now I go over to the attacker computer. 
we'll go ahead and plug in the cable. But I want to show you if we launch Chrome and we go into the save passwords here, there's absolutely no passwords that are stored. If we try, for example, going over to gmail.com, I'm not even logged in. So what I do with my transmitter device, and it doesn't matter, I don't have to hide it because now I'm in my personal space. I basically fire up a payload. And what this payload is doing is it's taking all the information from the victim's browser and it's importing it into my browser on my computer. So effectively, I'm becoming the victim. So now let's fire up my browser. And it changed a little bit. Here we have Kevin up here. We'll go ahead and click on Kevin. We'll click where the stored passwords are kept. And now, wow, we have a bunch of stored credentials. But I want to get access to the password, so I simply click on it. It's going to ask for my login password to this computer. I put it in. And I could basically decode all the stored credentials of the victim over here. So now I have their websites, I have the usernames, and I actually have their login passwords. Now, let's take a look and see if I'm logged in now to the same sites they are. So we'll go over here to gmail.com and I'm logged in. Let's go over here, let's go to Facebook. I'm logged into their Facebook account. Let's go over here to Twitter. I'm logged into the victim's Twitter account, which is my Twitter account. Let's go ahead and try uh, Office 365. Everywhere this victim was logged into, I'm now logged into. And, it, and for example, for logging into Office 365, I have two-factor authentication enabled. It doesn't matter. And let's try one more important site. That's Amazon Cloud Services. And when I go to that URL, I have to go ahead and go through this process, my account, I have to click on the management console. And then I have to click, now I'm logged in without, uh, without having to put in a password because again, the victim was logged in. So essentially what I did, as soon as the victim plugged in my cable, I basically exfiltrated all their information and now I'm able to import it into my computer and gain access to everything that they're logged into. And again, all the login credentials they stored in their browser. So what we need to do is we need to stop, look, and think before plugging in any device into your computer, whether, whether it's a computer mouse, whether it's a charging cable, it doesn't matter. You still have to be cautious because you never know if a threat actor weaponized that device. And secondly, you should never, ever store your passwords in your browser. You should always use a password manager. So stay safe, everybody. That's great. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you showing that to us because it really illustrates the fact that social engineering evolves to match the technology that's there and is going to take advantage of whatever new things are around. But Kevin, do you have uh, any thoughts that you want to share about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's so ordinary and people again are so polite. You could walk into any major coffee shop and I guarantee you're going to find somebody to plug it in. However, a real threat actor is going to target a particular, a particular individual or group of individuals that are in a company because they wanna compromise the company's IT assets. But how I use this on a recent pen test is I was um, testing a client and they had a very large retail uh, presence, I mean, pretty much in every mall. And uh, myself and one other team member went in during a very busy time into the store. And it was very interesting because employees would sit at a bench kind of like in the public area of the store and work on their MacBook Airs. And um, and they would, you know, when they'd help a customer out, they'd let the MacBook Air sit on the bench. So basically, 
uh, we call it, you know, from the old pickpocketing, uh, pickpocketing uh, lingo, they call it shade. So my associate that was with me kind of shaded, in other words, blocked the view of the retail reps to that MacBook Air that was logged in and sitting there. So I simply plugged in the cable, uh, initiated the payload, and the payload in this case wasn't to get Chrome credentials, it was actually to install an implant a la malware onto this MacBook Air and this retail establishment. And from there, we were able to get full control of this MacBook Air. It was logged into an account, which was the name of the uh, company, this you know the retail shop, and unbel unbelievably, that account in this had uh, root privileges. So you could basically run a command and you know your root on that box. Wow. And they actually stored credentials, including the Wi-Fi credentials for their point of sale system and for their employee network and the guest network in an uh, in a pages document because pages is like you know uh, you know for the mac it's an application for mac os x and uh, couldn't believe the find eventually based on this initial attack vector of plugging in this cable we're eventually able to control the entire well the company's entire aws infrastructure so it led to that from the simple attack so this is very real but just done in a different way wow that's amazing and and the other thing that really stood out to me about the specific example that you showed was just the the dumping of password browser uh, uh, br uh passwords from the browser you know it's something we've mentioned a few different times on this and as i know one of your favorite things to do as soon as you get access to uh to cookies and, and everything else but or, or to a device but um any thoughts that you have there on uh, just password vulnerabilities or browser-based vulnerabilities yeah don't store passwords in your browser because it's going to let in a threat actor laterally move into whatever cloud services you're using now mind you you might have 2fa and that's where the stored cookies come into play if you're if you have a current session open but i find in 90% of the organizations we test, and these are large companies, they typically store credentials in Chrome and other browsers. And I always encourage companies to use password managers, but people make mistakes even with password managers like uh, LastPass. So we've uh, recommended to several clients, you know, consider one password, consider LastPass. And then on the next test, uh, they were using LastPass, but the, the administrators never logged off of LastPass. So if we were able to gain control of their endpoint, because we got like domain admin privileges, we could RDP, which is remote desktop, into their endpoint, you know, after hours, they're still logged into LastPass and we could dump all their credentials from there. So the key is, you know, your credentials are the keys to the kingdom. You want to protect those with every potential resource you have. So if you're using a password manager at the end of the day, log out. I know it's a hassle to log in. You have to put in username, password, and maybe hopefully a 2FA, but do it because otherwise you're leaving yourself wide open. Right, right. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention no before browser password inspector, which is a free tool that we offer that helps admins understand some of the threats around stored uh, passwords within their environment. Um, yeah, why don't we move on just for a second? There's two interesting news items that I want us to talk about. And then I want to go back to this concept of some emerging trends and threats. But um, one of the things that has come up over the past uh, couple months since we've spoken was really, uh, I think, this, this idea that ransomware is much bigger and much scarier than just storing off somebody's bits and bytes and making those non-accessible. Um, we saw what at least seemed to be the first confirmed death uh, associated with ransomware. And this was out of Germany where uh, a hospital was taken down with ransomware and a patient had to be diverted because none of the systems were, were active there and that person died. Um, now, since then, there's been some uh, 
some people coming back and saying, well, that person may not have died just because of the ransomware. And in fact, uh, from a legal perspective, they said that the ransomware didn't meet the legal burden of having caused that death because there are some other factors at play. But it, it, I think it still does raise the issue of the fact that ransomware is, is increasingly destructive and that these cyber threats that we're all facing have a safety and a health perspective that can't be ignored whenever we're building the compensating controls around those. Um, Kevin, do you have any, any thoughts about where ransomware or where other uh, threats are going and how they may be crossing the cyber uh, physical divide? Yeah, it's downright scary. And don't forget the threat actors out there, a lot of them are from Russia they don't really care what happens. And uh, in this particular case, the doctors had said that the, this person would have died anyway, even though they were uh, defer, you know, they were referred to a different uh, hospital. Um, and it did go to causation. Basically, the, the in German law, you know, but for the hack, where did the person die? That's kind of the legal test. And right. uh, the prosecutors didn't believe it. That, that they could prove that, um, but that, but again, you have to think about: Wow, could a threat actor who's trying to monetize and attack random victims, or even potentially going after healthcare, could they po potentially cause people to die? That's a very serious consideration. I read this article in Wired about this uh, particular uh, attack, and what was really interesting and stood out was a quote, uh, well, basically from the, uh, from the, prosecu from the prosecution in, uh, in Dusseldorf, basically saying that causation could go beyond the attackers in this case, and they were looking at the culpability of the hospital's IT staff, thinking could have they better defended the hospital by monitoring the network more closely, that yeah. sort of thing. So now you have to think about, as a company, what is your liability? So if a threat actor uses phishing or breaks in through some sort of technological exploit and they deploy ransomware in your network and you didn't sufficiently and exercise due care to protect that network and somebody dies or gets hurt because of it, could that open you up to a very serious lawsuit? You know, that's a, that's a very serious question that companies need to start asking themselves. But I see it, you know, and in, in, this, in this article as well that I read in Wired, it was interesting because these uh, these fraudsters were going after uh, the university. They weren't going after the hospital in, in, in one particular case. And when the police contacted these fraudsters, because of course they left their calling card of where to send the Bitcoin and maybe a support email address. And they said, hey, you just, you just deployed your ransomware in a hospital. This could really affect the health and safety of, you know, of patients. Uh, fortunately, the bad guys actually gave the police the decryption key. So they were able to restore hospital records and that sort of thing. But of course, it didn't really work because the, the amount of time it would take to restore the hospital's operations because of this ransomware attack was somewhere the, along the lines of like 20 days. So the mm -hmm. damage has already been done. The, you, know, you can't unring the bell. But I think it goes to show you, Perry, where ransomware is going. The, the bad guys could care less of what the collateral damage is. They just want to make money. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, it's kind of like the buyer beware is, you know, us as potential targets and companies need to do whatever we can from a technological perspective and from the human firewall perspective to mitigate the chance that ransomware is going to infect our organization. And I really believe as part of, you know, as part of that, you really have to have a good uh, disaster recovery plan in case you are infected, where you could, you know, restore from your latest backups, hopefully that had been uh, in the last hour, you know, and, and not have to pay any ransom whatsoever, but be able to restore to a reasonable point in the past and have that whole process tested. I can't tell you how many times I've been contacted by people that do backups, but at a time of some disaster taking place, whether it's ransomware or some other situation that has arisen that they can't restore, 
their backups because they never tested that process out. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that out because that's a horror story that I've heard over and over and over again where people believe that their backups are, have, have been effective and then they go to use them and, and something is just not right. So yeah, guys, test your backups, test your disaster recovery, your business continuity plans, because uh, if 2020 has shown us nothing else, it's that uh, we need to expect and plan for as many of the unexpected things that can happen as possible. Um, I wanna get to one other interesting story that came out which is this phishing attack that happened whenever Trump, uh, uh, U.S. President Trump, uh, contracted COVID and was in the hospital. And of course, the the White House wasn't as forthright with uh, some and transparent with some of the updates as possible. So that created an information vacuum. And what happens whenever there's curiosity in an information vacuum is that the the bad guys rush in and use that as fish bait. So. Uh, what did you see about that, and what made that attack unique among some of the other attacks that have been happening recently? Well, this is a common way the threat actors are playing the game now, is they'll leverage uh, like Google Docs, Google Drive, and they'll link to documents there. And just because it is going to a Google Doc, it's trusted. I remember at No Before Con, I illustrated this the same type of attack where you clicked on a fake Zoom link and you authenticated, then you brought up a resume, and the resume was hosted in, in, Google, right. in Google Drive. So this is a common attack because it has a lot of trust and credibility because a, in, in, a threat actors could also use Google and have Google send out an email invite essentially saying, hey, uh, Perry shared a document with you or Susie shared a document with you. And again, it builds trust and credibility that this is legitimate because you're getting noticed by Google or, um, you know, Microsoft's, uh, you know, platform, um, OneDrive, right? Same, same sort of idea. And then people trust it, and then they could open up the document. The document can contain a hyperlink because, you know, Google is going to look, try to mitigate malware that sits on Google, on, on Google Drive. I don't think it's, it's as effective as when you receive an email and Google right. you know, runs through its checks and balances. Um, but in any case, it could just be another document with another hyperlink to now the real malicious attack, and then people uh, unfortunately are compromised. Yeah, yeah, and um, this doesn't relate to Google Docs and O365 so much, but one of my favorite things that I still see in phishing emails uh, that are targeting web-based email is these message clipped fish that come through where, where part of the message looks truncated and it says message clipped because oh, yeah. the you know the size is so big and then that entices somebody to click on it um but let's let's go back to this concept of of trends there's a few that i want us to be able to hit on within the short time that we have left um the first thing is, I know that you brought a few interesting phishing templates that you want to show us of things that we've seen in the wild. Why don't you go ahead and uh, maybe share your screen and see if we can take a look at some of those. Okay, sounds great. One moment. Great. So ignore the one on the left. We're looking at this one right here. And this is one from Office 365. And uh, well, not really from Office 365. But of course, this is your standard fish. It's coming from some random domain to a target, you know, because they want Frank to fall for this thing. And then, you know, it's basically saying your payments decline. So when your payment is declined, you're worried about losing access to your services. So it's a very strong motivator to pay attention to this email and, and, and comply with what the email is requesting you to do. And if you go over each of these, um, uh, if you go over each of these hyperlinks here, you could see at the bottom. Can you see that, Perry? I could see it on my screen. I just want to make sure it's sharing that hyperlink. That yeah, I can see it. Yeah, so if you look at these, of course, that's Threat Actor. That's not a real Office 365 or Microsoft domain. So if you click on any of these and you, you, and you take a look, you're going to know it's a phishing attack. What the problem is, is people need to be taught that that's what they need to do. They just might assume clicking on this link is going to a real Microsoft 
domain, right? Just, you know, just following the instructions in the email and not even realize it. So that's why it's so critically important to hover over the link. Now, of course, there are tricks that attackers could do when you hover over the link, they could put a fake uh, uh, email hover text message up here. So when you hover over the link, it's actually fake and not real, and this will show up. It usually works on web-based browsers. So if you're logged in like to G Suite, Office 365, over you know the web-based interface, not the local client, what will happen is in the code in the HTML or even in JavaScript, uh, a threat actor could set it up so when you hover over the link, it actually displays the fake URL. But what you have to do is pay attention to looking at it out of band, and that's at the bottom bottom left of your window, and then you can see the link where the where the link is really going. And that's what's critical in this case. Yeah, we actually published a blog recently on hover over uh, fakery that happens. And and I think that the, the takeaway there is that everybody needs to realize that if you're viewing email in a browser, that browser is interpreting HTML and that HTML has a lot of flexibility in how it chooses to display things and how attackers can craft that. Yeah, I'm looking for it. It was on a LinkedIn message and now you had the perfect example Oh, here it is. So here, uh, another email, LinkedIn. It's And by the way, LinkedIn does not s send an email from LinkedIn at some random domain. So that's a, a very simple red flag to catch, very suspicious. But if you look here, it tells you to click on this LinkedIn URL. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at the bottom of the screen, that's not really going to LinkedIn. So this is a primary example of essentially spoofing the URL when it's really gonna go somewhere else. So people need to really be trained to pay attention to the out of band message, which is at the bottom left of your browser. Great, thank you. So let's uh, close this one. Uh, we already looked at this one. SharePoint, same type of thing, malicious links. No matter where you click, if you look at the bottom, it's going to this landing fac uh, domain. Um, that is obviously not real. It's allegedly coming from Equifax. I mean, it, just by, you know, someone like me who has a lot of experience of spotting the red flags really quickly, um, if you're just learning about this, you know, one thing, I don't even know if there's a 742 area code. Um, I'm pretty familiar with area codes. I could be wrong. It might exist. But every time you click on something, it's going to this page xl.com. And I don't I don't know where that goes. If you go down here, this could be going to real links, this doesn't matter. But what they're trying to do is trick the person to going here. Um, any comments, Barry, before I close it? No, I, th I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great example. You know, the, the biggest thing that I'll say that's come up on these first three is that they are leveraging trust as well. I mean, these are all well-trusted names and brands and people get a false sense of security with that. Yeah, look at this one here. They even, they, they, this is you know a, a simple trick where the bad actor is putting this big warning. This is an external, external email. Don't click on any links or attachments unless you recognize it. And then at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a fraudulent email. So again, this is Microsoft 365 Business. Uh, they did the fish a little bit amateur because we don't see the image here. Uh, I'm displaying all images in my browser, so that's actually the fish. And if you click on view the invoice, look at that Look at that uh, URL. That's like leak speak for Microsoft. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, I mean, that's like a slap in the face, right? That that this is this is fraud. And then if you look at it, why would some invoice or Microsoft be coming from my Providence Bank? It just doesn't yeah. make, make, make any sense. Now, if we look at the the from URL, and we look at the to URL, it could have been an internal fish. They're trying mm. to spoof internally. So that that could be it. So let's look at another one. Here's one to um, uh, Collins Credit Union. They're saying that there's um, there's been some changes made to Sophos, Sophos, remote access infrastructure, like you know SSL VPN. And then you could access the portal here. But if you click on it and you look down there, at the bottom, office365world.com, 
that makes no sense. That's obviously uh, something highly suspicious. Right. Uh, let's take a look at some more. This one, it didn't even render. No, it didn't even render the uh, the, the 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 picture. Um, and if we take a look at the link here, back up my data. Look at that strange URL at the bottom. Um, yeah, that is janky. Yeah, and it's it's passing the email address of the person that, that it's going to, as well at the end, that CPA firm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, that probably goes straight to a database saying that this person falls for these kind of work. things. So go ahead and yeah. fish them again. Exactly. So now the fishers can keep track. Uh, here's one that's actually done quite well. Uh, it's they actually spoofed Amazon.com. Do you see up there? Yep. Well, they just spoofed the display, the display name. So it looks real, gains credibility. But again, they're saying we could not process your last order. But if the person didn't make an order, obviously this would be disregarded. But either way, they thought they made an order. They thought somebody made an order on their behalf. They might take a look. And if you look at it, all the links, they go to the same site which is newtonband.net. I don't think newtonband.net is Amazon. At least no. the last time I checked. <laughs> but, but again, I think you know system one may kick in here and somebody say, wow, did somebody hack my Amazon account and start ordering stuff? I better click on this and go see. Exactly. That, that would be the powerful motivator. You know, we could not process your last order. Uh-oh, did somebody, you know, make an order on my behalf? That sort of thing. Let's take a look more because I'm trying to speed through these a little bit. Craigslist, um, we need you to confirm some information to keep using your account. That's a huge red flag of telling the target they need to do something or they're going to lose access. You know the old the old story with uh, I believe Cialdini is people will do more to avoid a loss than to realize a gain. Right. You know, according to Dr. Robert Cialdini in his book of influence. And this is using that, it's framing the email in that in that particular way here. So if we look, and this is the uh, this is the, the telltale. You don't spell below like this, B-E-L-L-O-W, right? And this right. is like trying to motivate the target to comply quickly. So that's where they're in that uh, system one mode of thinking. And then we look at the update and we see it's going to some garbage URL. Uh, amateur, amateur type of attack. This one giving you the fake warning. We come, it's coming from ZFO.net, which is a known hacker group, by the way. Um, uh, so that's kind of odd. But the same type of trick we showed before. The link is outlook.office365.com. Let's go ahead and highlight it. And we look at the bottom and it's going to AppSpot, one of Google's domains, right? Uh, so typical phishing type of attack. Typical, let's trick the person by displaying a fake URL. Let's go to the next one, Intuit. This would be great for a threat actor to get access to your books. And I don't know if Intuit lets, let, lets anyone write checks. You know, we're doing a security upgrade from our old server. You know what my th first thought, Perry, is? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to think of any excuse to get the victim to log in. Yeah, we're doing yep. a security upgrade. You're going to lose access. We're resyncing your applications. It always goes towards, hey, if you don't do this, you're going to be inconvenienced. So whenever you get an email that frames it in that way, your antenna should go up. And you should think about it in, in the system two way of thinking, which I could let Perry uh, Yeah, explain. well, I mean, and you should definitely think about it based on the, the size of organization that you're dealing with because i have done business before with let's say content providers um of, of really specialized content so usually like a one two or three person shop and then they migrate to a different um content host and they're like you need to reset up your account um, that can happen really legitimately but with a, a company like intuit or bank of america or amazon or something else you're not going to get stuff like that um, and then you can you can always and should always just go verify it if it ever seems like it is a legitimate request because um, yeah it, at that point you are giving away keys to the kingdom for those accounts. Yeah, take a look at this. Look at uh, uh, hovering over upgrade account. Look at the link on the bottom. That's clever. 
because all the threat mm -hmm. actor did was set up an, an AWS instance. Basically, they set up a host in Amazon and they provided the, instead of putting the IP address there, they just gave the internal Amazon uh, host name for that internal IP. Yeah. So that's a, the, and the, you know, so this is very clever, um, meaning not very clever, I mean better, because now <laughs> you think, well, you, it, it's a little bit of a step up. You know, and then you have to think about why is it coming from Columbia.edu? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's somebody you work with what you got. Yeah, let's take a look at another one. This is one of your favorites, I think, kind of almost like, you know, view more to see your message. Click here. Yep. Is, your message is blocked. Oh, no. Who's trying to email me that I won the lottery? <laughs> you know, and uh, you, you, exactly. You click on those settings and it's going to obviously this malicious domain at the bottom ro-norse.com, typical, right? And if you highlight over here, it's going to the same domain. So each hyperlink going to the same domain, that's another trick, right? Because the threat actor wants to encourage you, hey, you know, there's some important information waiting. It could be critical to you. And by the way, the only way you're gonna be able to see this is click this link, right? So, yep. and look up here, they're spoofing it from Google Mail. <laughs> Right, so, you know, they're trying, you know, uh, again, I'd call this like a kind of a uh, medium, uh, uh, medium amateur type of attack. Right. Um, but here, um, I think this is a potentially a malicious attachment. They want you to download this PDF file. I don't know if that PDF file contains another malicious link or if it could be a malicious PDF that just exploits you. And by the way, again, to raise people's trust in the email, it gives you this fake warning. This email originated from outside the organization. Be careful. Right, you know? right. And it looked like this was internally spoofed. So why is Denise sending the same, her, why is she sending an email from herself to her? That makes no sense. Right. Yeah, especially if she's from outside the organization too. That's uh, you've got a, a multiple personality disorder type of thing going on there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you look at these fishes and you actually pay attention and take the time to look at it, you go, "Oh my God, you know this is quite funny." Or yeah, yeah, or good try, you know, you yeah. think, good try, and and all this sort of thing. But they go from amateurish, you know, with lots of misspellings and not a lot of work put in because they're doing this at scale. And then it goes into super sophisticated uh, ultra spear phishing attacks that you know we do in our pen testing, and it's mm -hmm. always we never fish on the first email. That's the rule. We always fish after we gain uh, trust in the email chain, and then yeah. you fish. So, um, and then another thing that these tend to focus on is is some kind of urgency or curiosity. You open that curiosity bubble, and it's like an itch that needs to be scratched. Um, which, speaking of of curiosity, I know that you brought another demo, and we are almost out of time. So, I want to make sure to get to to that. Um, is there any setup that you want to do to talk about this uh, this this kind of scary new tactic that we're seeing out there? No, I mean, this is a real, well, uh, uh, yes, I'd like to speak about it, but uh, um, this is quite scary if it's not patched. This vulnerability was published uh, by a gentleman in the Netherlands, uh, I believe around August of this year. And essentially this kind of opens the door to your organization for anyone that's on the inside that has network connectivity. They basically could you know, get the keys to the kingdom, all your all your users and uh, password hashes, um, doesn't require any authentication whatsoever. So basically, once somebody's on the inside of the network, and this could go to a disgruntled insider, by the way, that could leverage this vulnerability, not necessarily an outsider, so that, you know, that should be concerning. But how a typical threat actor would exploit this is they'd get the initial foothold on the network by exploiting some web application on the outside, or more likely by doing a phishing attack, get their initial hold on the network and then leverage that hold to exploit this very scary vulnerability to essentially get the keys to the kingdom. So anytime you want to roll the video, uh, Perry, uh, go for yeah, it. Yeah, let's go for that now. 
Hi, I'm Kevin Mitnick. I'm Noble Force Chief Hacking Officer, and I want to demonstrate this very dangerous vulnerability that would allow a threat actor to take complete control of your Active Directory environment. And how this works is this vulnerability allows an attacker to change or remove the password on the computer account on the domain controller. And this computer account has special privileges where we're able to dump all the password hashes. And what's more concerning is this attack could be done by a malicious insider. All it takes is somebody on the network. You don't even have to have any credentials. And if you could communicate with the domain controller, you could execute this attack and get the keys to the kingdom, which are all the password hashes that exist on the domain controller. Why this happened is a developer at Microsoft when coding the Microsoft NetLog on remote protocol made a mistake in the cryptographic routine and set the initialization vector to all zeros. But we're not going to get into the technicalities here. We're just going to demonstrate how this works. Now, we're going to do this from the outside. So what we're going to do is send the victim a phishing attack. And once we're able to get malware on that victim's workstation, we're going to be able to execute this attack and get access to all the password hashes in the company. So let's, without further ado, Let's go ahead and open Google Chrome. And we're going to log into Office 365. And we're logged in as the victim. This is John Rafuse, who works in human resources. And what we did is this, this phishing attack is a little bit different. What we're doing here is we're using a secure emailer. There's two reasons for that. One, we want to build trust and credibility that this is a legit email. And secondly, a lot of the email providers out there, whether it's uh, G Suite or Office 365, trust these secure emailers so they don't end up getting blocked. So let's go ahead and take a look. We have an email from Send Safely. It says a new item for kmitnick at mitnicksecurity.com. Let's go ahead and view the item. And a lot of these secure emails do two-factor authentication. So what I'd have to do is supply the email address, it would send me a code, and then I'd be, have access to the email, the secure email. But here I turn that off to make it quicker. So we're just gonna be able to go into the message. And here we have it. It says a secure message with files, which means it has an attachment. And the message says, John, please find my expenses attached. If the amounts don't show up correctly in the spreadsheet, please cl first click on Enable Editing, and then click on Enable Content to ensure all the values load correctly. Then it says to remit payment to the Kevin Mitnick Charity, Care of the White House, which obviously is a joke. Anyway, what we have here is an attachment of the expense spreadsheet. We're gonna go ahead and download it. And I know what a lot of you are thinking, this is a simple macro. No, we're using a different technique. We're using a macro to load the values, which is completely not malicious. So a lot of the EDRs and AV products won't detect it as malicious. And we're using a very dated technique that I'm not going to get into at this time to actually install the implant on the victim's machine once they go ahead and click enable content. So before we do that, I downloaded the Excel spreadsheet here. Let's go ahead and bring up our Cobalt Strike listener. This is a framework that pen testers use. Threat actors could use it too. Once the victim's computer is infected, we're going to get a connection over here. So let's go ahead and minimize that. Let's go ahead and open up the XLS file. Now, as you can see, here we have expenses, but we have no amounts. And if we remember the email we just read, if it does, did not load properly, click Enable Editing, then click Enable Content. So we'll go ahead and follow through as the victim, Enable Editing and then enable content. Before I click enable content, I wanna bring up the Cobalt Strike listener. We have nothing here. And then we're gonna go ahead and click enable content. And all of a sudden, all the values load up, which is what the victim is told what will happen here. But if we take a look over here, we could see there's been a connection from the victim's computer from J, logged in as J Rafuse. So once 
they clicked enable content, it, it, it executed another type of vulnerability that we're able to install malware. So let's go ahead and interact with the malware. And set the sleep to zero. And what we want to do in this case is we want to escalate our privileges. We want to get to all the domain hashes on the domain controller. But first, let's see what privileges the JRefuse account has. If we look, the JRefuse account only has domain user. That person's not an administrator, has no special privileges. So the next step is to gain those privileges. So the first thing we're going to do is try to identify the name of the fully qualified domain name of the domain controller, the one that is being used to log into, so we can exploit that domain controller and gain access. So we're going to look here. And what we have is we have the login server as DC1. And scroll down a little bit. And the domain is fuzzbunch.com. So the domain controller we want to exploit on the internal network is dc1.fuzzbunch.com. But the first thing we have to do is we're going to install a proxy. What this allows us to do is use the server that Cobalt Strike is on to communicate with the malware on John's workstation, but we could use the Linux operating system and we could use a different tool set to accomplish our mission. So let's go ahead and install the proxy. And there we go. So the proxy is installed. So now our next step is to exploit this very dangerous vulnerability that I mentioned in the initial part of this demo. So let's go ahead. We're going to type zero logon. And then we're going to pass it the domain, the, the name of the domain controller, the host name that we want to exploit. And what this is going to do, it's going to blank out the password to the computer account on this domain controller so we can get access to the password hashes. So let's go ahead and do it. Success. So here we are. And then it has this here, which looks like gibberish. What this is, is actually it's a password hash. And it's the password hash for an empty password. And what we need to do is when we do the next step, we need to pass our script the password to the computer account, which is essentially blank. So let's go ahead and copy it. And then we're going to go over here to our Cobalt Strike host. And now we're going to execute a shell script and we're going to pass it the password hash for a blank password. And what this is going to do is do what we call a DC sync operation. And essentially what we're able to do is dump all the password hashes on the domain. So let's go ahead and do it. And it takes a little while. There's a bit of a lag because it is going through John Rafuse's workstation. So we'll see a little bit of a lag here. And here we go. The password hashes for administrator, for guest are, are sitting here and dumping. So we'll give it a moment. And so an attacker could upload these password hashes to a GPU cracker and likely crack the password if, if they're not too difficult. And the other thing an attacker could do is do a technique called pass the hash, which I'm going to show you in a moment that allows us to essentially abuse the account without even having knowledge of the password. So let's go ahead and we're going to exploit this account or abuse this account administrator. But what we're going to do is copy the password hashes. There's two here. There's what we call the LM hash, land manager, and the NTLM hash. To use the tool that we're going to use next, we need both of them. So now let's clear the screen. Now we're going to go ahead and use a different script. We're going to pass it the username, which is administrator, and its associated password hash. So what this is going to do, it's going to connect to the domain controller. It's going to use the, the hash using the pass the hash technique, and it's going to log us in, and we're going to get a command line shell. So let's go ahead and execute it. So 
And again, there's a tiny bit of a lag. There we go. We have our C prompt. Let's type who am I? Let's see who we are. And we're the administrator on the on Fuzzbunch. Now let's see what host name we're on. Here we are on DC1. So now we're logged in as the administrator on DC1. So this is how a threat actor could essentially gain complete control of your Active Directory environment. So what do you need to do? Patch, patch, and patch. Every domain controller in your company needs to be patched. And Microsoft has released a patch. They re released a roll-up patch for the zero logon vulnerability. And I encourage you to install it as soon as possible. Don't delay. So everybody, please stay safe out there. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for sharing that. We're going to let your last words from that be uh, kind of the last thought for this webinar um, is patch, patch, patch. And <laughs> uh, your, your testimony advice from 20 years ago on watch out for social engineering and train your users because uh, this thing that we call the human condition is real um, and we're all vulnerable. So uh, Kevin, thank you so much for a great 2020 series of webinars. I really appreciate all that you do for us and for the InfoSec community. And uh, why don't you cap us off with any last words that you have and we'll end. No, I think it just illustrates that the bad guys will layer social engineering like phishing attacks, so layer uh, technological exploits to compromise your company and steal IT assets. And I think it's a, it's a huge wake up call that organizations need to focus really on the human element and train their people about these threats. And at the same time, of course, have their technolo technological controls in place. And yeah, this is our last webinar of 2020. Our next one will be in 2021. 2020 hasn't been the greatest year. <laughs> so I, I have to say it. I'd say the least. I can't wait till we're in 2021 and then we'll be on and upward. And uh, I look forward to continuing the series with you, Perry. It's been, uh, it's been fantastic. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining. And we look forward to talking to you again in 2021. Bye-bye.